Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. This is Adam Hamdy, the author of Black 13 and Red Wolves, and you're enjoying the Thriller Zone with David Temple. Bam. Look at you, one take wonder. I want to say a great big welcome to our British novelist and screenwriter, author of the Pendulum Trilogy of Conspiracy Thrillers. Please welcome Adam Hamdy. Hello, Adam. Hi, David. Thank you for having me on the show. I, uh, I know we're going to talk about your books that you've done and the collaborations that you've done. Uh, I've, I was able to get through uh, um, Black 13, part of the Scott Pierce thriller series. And I got to tell you something. It was published back in January, I believe. And uh, it was a top 20 Kindle international bestseller. And now I know why. And I wanted to say to you, for fear of sounding like some suck up, uh, you know, a guy who will say anything <laughs> to bribe the attention of his guests. But and I wrote down three points so that I would be very specific. But it is truly one of the most intriguing novels I've read this year. Thank you. Wow, yeah. it's really, really kind of you. Well, and there, there is a couple, and I, and I'm surprised that I haven't heard of you before. But thanks to our mutual friend Eric Bishop, he introduced me to you, and we were able to make a contact. And I'm, and I picked up this book, and I, 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 I literally couldn't put it down in between uh, projects. But here's exactly what I liked about Black 13. Your characters feel extremely real. And I say that meaning they all have a heart and, and they don't feel like stick figures. A lot of times I'll read thrillers and they feel like they're kind of cut and paste of old stories. Um, but man, the heart and the history behind the personalities, I literally felt within chapters that I genuinely knew them and I wanted to go on each one of their journeys with them. And I, I, I just, I think that's a great, great compliment for you. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Secondly, and, and, I, and I say this and I'm like, how, what can I say to Adam that, that I can appear to be a guy's guy, but still have some kind of uh, intellectual decorum? <laughs> I mean, you have such a, a guy's background, but I, I came up with this. It's your prose is quietly elegant. And what I mean by that is you have, you have turns of a phrase and you'll take a phrase that I may have never quite heard before in a description. And I, and I love the minimal descriptions you're, you're, you give just enough to really set the scene and with just very few words, a broad picture is painted and I and I sat, sat there going, gosh, darn, how does he do that? I mean, it 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 really is a talent. No, thank you. But but basically, the point of that is you, you can enhance a scene without distracting it. And and quietly elegant just seems to be the way it, it ha and by that I almost seen it's like a, it's like literary fiction inside of a thriller, which I don't see very often. Wow. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you to say as well. Well, wow. and the third, you, you're, and you can, by now you're thinking, oh, geez, okay. But, <laughs> but, 
you pull me in in a particular manner. It's as though you're letting, this is what it is. It's like you're letting me in on a secret and, but you're holding me at arm's length to see if I'll stick around for the rest of the story. If I'm, if you'll stick around, David, I'll reveal it over here, but it's so delicately done uh, without going, dun, 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 turn the page to find out what's next. It's just, it's quietly <laughs> done and, and there you have it. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's uh, very kind of you to say. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I really appreciate it when people get what I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you've, you've identified three things that I consciously try and do. Um, so, yeah, well done. <laughs> well, I don't know that I, uh, I'll be perfectly frank, I don't know that I spend as, I don't always have enough time to spend as much time analyzing or breaking down or even finishing the books with as many interviews as I want, but I really do try to do service to it because there's nothing worse than just be speaking generically. And, uh, and I was captivated uh, by the opening, uh, well, the opening scene is, pretty grabbing. But then Scott Pierce, the way he opens the story, and I'm halfway into it. And there's not going to be any spoiler alerts here. And I'm like, okay, this is before I'd done some deep dive on you. I'm like, okay, Adams, he's a rock climber. He's got to be, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not as good as Scott Pierce, but yeah, I do a rock climb. I've been climbing for over 20 years. So yeah, on and off. Uh, I'm on one of my off periods at the moment. Unfortunately, I've fractured my foot, but uh yeah. Uh, so, and I fractured it climbing. So yeah, I'm on a, on an off period at the moment, but yeah, I, I do climb. Was it in, was it a twist in a crevice or was it a fall? Uh, it was actually a, a sort of stumble fall and it wasn't anything particularly dangerous. I uh, was actually putting in a safety line for one of our children um, because our youngest has started lead climbing. So anyone who knows about climbing knows that that's when they start taking the rope up with them and they're not roped in from the top. So, um, you know, when they're that young, you kind of put in just the first clip so that you know that they're not going to fall from nine feet or whatever. Um, so, and I stumbled as I did it. And anyway, there we go. <laughs> I am amazed at rock climbing and the guts that it takes. And there, I'm going to completely annihilate this. There is a documentary on a free climber that I saw. Yeah, free solo. Yeah, Alex oh, Holland. Yeah. See that? Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, if you know anything about climbing, even if you don't know about climbing, but if you know anything about climbing and you realize the difficulty of the things that he was doing without a rope at that height, I, I mean, my wife and I, she climbs as well. She's not as uh, fearless as I am. Um, she gets quite nervous climbing, but she's, you know, still does it. And we sat in the, the um, theater watching the movie uh, and both of our part, uh, both our hands were just absolutely <laughs> wet with terror, vicarious terror, because what he was doing is absolutely, it's, it's kind of, it's the hardest kind of climbs you could be doing, but to do it without any safety gear. Yeah. That's just, so, uh, did, did I see if I got this right? He actually is lacking, um, uh, a chemical in his brain. I don't know if it's a chemical in his brain or that, that, uh, that he doesn't fear or that he goes, yeah, it's a risk. Well, everything's a risk. Is that, did I, do I remember yeah, that? Yeah. Right? He, yeah. He's, he, um, if you follow him on Twitter, he put up, uh, when, when he was actually making the documentary, he went and had his brain scanned and they found that he had an absence of that sort of fear center. Um, so yeah, he, he is wired up slightly differently. And I think that came across in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, we go out climbing um, and, you know, we'll go up a sort of 100, 150 foot rock face and take the kids. Um, our kids, we've got three kids. They've all been climbing since they were three years old. Um, you know, the first time you take them outside and you're taking them up 120 foot rock face, it's nerve wracking for them, but it's also nerve wracking as a parent. Oh, sure. I'll be sitting, yeah, I'll be sitting at the top of that uh face you know i'm i'm anchored in and I'm, I'm as safe as i can possibly be and i'm looking at you know our youngest started doing um uh outdoor uh you know rock climbing when he was about five so he's five years old and he's coming up this you know quite steep vertical face 
um, not hugely difficult, but still very exposed, very high. And I'm sort of thinking, wow, I literally have his life in my hands. And I think in those circumstances, a little bit of fear is very useful. Yeah. It just make, you know, you make sure that everything is as safe as it can possibly be. But to know that they're dangling on the other end of that, and any, oh, that's the one thing that I couldn't get about this free solo was that at any moment, uh, and I, I often said, I turned to my wife and I said, does everyone realize that if he just slips one, I mean, that is it. End of story. Yeah. Anyway. And some of the, some of the, um, some of the features and the uh, footholds, the handholds, the things that he's holding onto, they're almost non-existent. You know, if you <laughs> looked at them, they're just so tiny. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And so in the, in the book, you know, Scott Pierce is kind of a, a, a level below Alex Honnold, probably about three or four levels above where I am uh, as a climber. Yeah. Um, but I know enough about, you know, that sort of world to, I hope, to write with some authenticity. Well, it's funny. There's a there's a move that he makes in the movie where he swings his hand behind him. And he I think he's doing something like this and he has to swing over. And you did that in the book. Yeah. I, first of all, uh, I can barely decide if I'm hanging here and I move to this direction where I am. But you're doing you're doing a 180 and you're hoping that your hand can actually grasp at the other end. And my, yeah. my palms were sweating as I read it. So that's kudos to you. Well, that, that's good. I mean, we, we uh, you know, when I first started climbing, you'd see think you know, you'd see people doing crazy things, you know, doing sort of um, uh, horizontal climbing where you're on a cave roof and moving across the roof. Oh. And I just thought I'd never be able to do that. But actually, just a bit of perseverance and uh, and learning the technique. It's more technique than anything else. And, and you can get there. It's, it's a lot of fun. I love it. So you do have to you have to, uh, and I know this sounds oversimplistic, but you once you learn techniques and you practice it to where you can just fall a couple of feet, you do transfer that to, well, as long as I'm doing the techniques correctly, I'm going to be okay for all practical purposes, unless a bird flies out and smacks me in the face or my hand slips. I mean, is that kind of safe to yeah, say? Yeah, I mean, I've been out climbing. I mean, I, we, I made the mistake of going and climbing a, a, a limestone um, cliff formation. And I did the first climb after winter. Um, and this was spring two years ago. And it was a climb I hadn't done before. And I would checked the guidebook and they'd said, you know, it's not too difficult. And it was well within my comfort zone. But what I didn't realize, what I'd forgotten, and again, this is my, my fault. And this is, you know, one of the ways you learn as a climber was that with limestone after winter with all the freezing and the water coming down and the ice and everything you get large chunks of this stuff coming off as you climb up yep and so i, I climbed up this face and literally everywhere i was trying to put safety gear because you go up you know I'm, I'm lead climbing so i'm taking the rip with me and i'm putting in cams and nuts and hexes which are little anchor points as you go up and you find gaps in the rock to to do this and literally everywhere I was trying to place I'd pull at the rock and it would come away in my hands Ooh. It'd come away in my hands and I got about 40 feet up before I could place my first and it was the tiniest tiniest little cam I had on my um, on my gear rack and yeah it was it was very nerve-wracking so I don't think you ever feel completely safe when you're out climbing but certainly practicing inside helps give you some confidence and it also gives you a bit of knowledge about how to get out of trouble if you if you find yourself in a sticky situation last question on this and then we'll move back to the books and i've always wondered this when you're putting those cams and anchors in the rocks and i don't know if it's a silly question and you get to the top i'm assuming you use the same things going down and do you take those tools with you as you leave uh yeah so that what will tend to happen is i'll lead climb up and then my wife or one of the children will come up and they pull the anchors out as they climb up. And so they, they gather them as they, as they come to the next pitch point, you know, which might be the summit or it could be a, a ledge. They'll bring them up with them as they come up. And then when you get to the top, depending on what kind of route it is, you'll either walk down or you'll abseil down. So you set up an anchor point at the top and you, you abseil down. I prefer to walk down. Um, but <laughs> You know, every now and again, that's not not possible. So, um, but yeah, you you bring all the gear because it's you know that that's kind of 
it's quite valuable gear and um, you, you'd be a very expensive hobby if you left it behind every time. So someone will pick it out as they come up. Yeah. And if you're afraid of heights, just uh, maybe do canoeing instead. Yeah, maybe. Uh, to be fair, though, my wife is absolutely terrified of heights, but she's still. What? She'll still climb. Yeah, she she she. Uh, and, and the children have had their moments where they've been really scared, I think. You know, again, I think it's like so many things in life. It just takes a bit of confidence. You need to know that the gears, you have to fail a few times to know that the gear is going to hold you and that you're safe and nothing bad is going to happen. Um, and it's perfectly natural to be afraid of heights. I'll be sometimes sitting at the top, you know, literally my feet hanging, dangling over the edge of a vertical cliff face. And I look down and you just get that lurch in your stomach that, ah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to test out any of these anchors and, and the ropes and stuff. It's funny, though, there, uh, you could uh, use a, a similar uh, analogy or metaphor for being a writer. I mean, you have to trust in your technique, the way you want to tell the story, the way you form a sentence, like we were talking earlier, and trust that this is the biggest thing. you got to trust that people want to read it. And Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, you know, because it is quite a... A bold thing. I mean, you know, storytelling started in a with an oral tradition of people sitting around a fire and telling tales. And you know, it takes confidence to hold forth and to say, think that you've got something that's worthwhile to say that you're going to, you know, captivate people or entertain them, make them feel something, thrill them, make them sad or or make them laugh. Whatever it is, it's um, you know, it is a, in a way, in many ways, it's an honor. And I think that's why it's such a big deal to become a published author. It's an honor to be published and for someone else to say, okay, listen to this person, listen to them and, and hear what they've got to say. Yeah. And you know what, there's, uh, you're traditionally published and I'm self-published and, you know, in the self-published world, it really is all up to you, all the, and I know that a lot of that still translates to traditional publishing. It isn't just a free ride once you get the big advanced check, but it is a daunting, it can be a daunting experience to spend that time in the chair and then, have to do the marketing, the sales and the ads and so forth. And someone asked me recently, what's the toughest thing that you, you face as an author? And, and, you know, they named off a couple of things. I'm like, no, I'm like the easiest thing for me and only comes with time is sitting in the chair and committing to it because I've always been pretty self-disciplined growing up in my other careers. But the toughest thing is, uh, and this happened with my recent release, uh, and is wondering and worrying if anyone will not like it or you'll get a bad review. And uh, sometimes you'll focus too much on that bad review when in reality, God, my wife is always telling me, just don't read them. Just don't read them. Yeah, but I want to know what they think. She goes, yeah. Some of these people are just angry, sad people. Anyway. I... Yeah, I mean, I have a general rule that I don't read reviews, no. good or bad. Yeah, I don't. Um, uh, sometimes I have to go on the Amazon page to get a link or, you know, find out some. Sometimes it's the easiest place to copy the publisher's, you know, blurb or whatever. Sure. But I'll never scroll down. I'll see the rating. <laughs> That's enough for me. You know, I'll, I'll never scroll down because... I think once you start listening to good or bad reviews, I think once you um, let that into your life, you can become obsessed with it. And I've seen authors who have become obsessed with it and they always focus on the one star review as opposed to the thousands of five star reviews that they've got because it's human nature. You, know, you, you we're, we're, we're trained as people not to believe the good press in general, um, unless you're a narcissist, but we focus you know, very much on the on the bad and on the negative. And as you say, you don't know who this person is. They could be angry. Someone might have run over their cat. Someone could have stepped on their foot. You've got their, you know, they picked up your book at the wrong time and the wrong day and they feel really mad about something else. And suddenly you've got a one-star review. Yeah. Well, I've done it myself. I, I've never given one-star reviews, but I've watched a movie or read a book and I've thought, oh, this isn't very good. And then I come back to it two years later and I think, what the hell was I thinking? This is a really good piece of work. So your, your tastes and your perspective can change as well. Yeah. Uh, I got a question and it, and it came to me when I was doing some research. What would you say if you were trying to describe it, the difference between a conspiracy thriller and say 
a political thriller or, or, or maybe better yet, espionage. Do you see a differentiation between that? Um, I mean, I would say uh, espionage thriller for me always sort of conjures up state intervention, state actors. You know, it's usually one agency versus another or some intelligence agency is involved. And that for me would be kind of the general boundaries of an espionage thriller. I think for a political thriller, you know, they're usually set in the corridors of power, whether it's the White House or you know, Congress in the States or the House of Commons over here, the House of Parliament here, number 10 Downing Street. Um, I think a conspiracy thriller is, is uh, has no rules. You know, it's basically you and I, two people, can form a conspiracy. We can have a secret plan and we can get on with it. We're not linked to any spy agency, at least I don't think so. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't think either of us are senators, but we can come up with a secret plan to do something or to achieve an objective. And I think that's what makes conspiracy thrillers um, interesting for me because they're outside of the boundaries of any institution, outside of any um, official body. And I think if you look at the world and what's going on now, increasingly these unofficial collectives, groupings are having huge influence, whether it's the people who tried to storm the Capitol in the States, whether it's people like Extinction Rebellion, um, you know, operating globally now, I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't class them as the same kinds of people, but they're having an impact on our lives and they're non-traditional, non-official um, organizations. And so for me, that's kind of where the boundaries are. But obviously, I think there's a lot of crossover. There are conspiracies in politics. There are conspiracies in espionage. But if you put me on the spot and I had to define them, that's kind of how I would, how I would think about them. Well, you had me at uh, no rules. I've never been a big one for following rules anyway. I think it must be my <clears throat> ultra-religious upbringing. And... <laughs> <laughs> Being told what to do and how to do it and when to do it and how to do it. And like, yeah, F that. Not really. <laughs> so is, 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 is Temple the type of upbringing you had and your surname? Uh, it is both, sadly, or gladly. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah, it is. And it is. It is not a, a stage name. You'd get shouts out like, oh, hey, David Church, hey, Temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. And um, I'm like, yeah, how about Temple, like the side of your head? Okay, how about that? But anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. what is the, what, what, so, other than, um, you know, waiting to see how people respond to your books, and what do you find the toughest part of writing and marketing your books? Because I mean, I, I self published a book um, way back when um, called Battalion, and I have huge respect for self-published authors because you are doing everything and you're out there kind of naked as well you 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 it's literally there's no interface between you and the fans no interface between you and the readers so you 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 know it feels quite to me quite exposed it's very exposed it's it's the hardest thing i've ever done my first career was radio and i i started very young i knew exactly what i wanted i i set my target and i was not taking no for an answer and i worked my way up to the top markets in the country new york la chicago detroit philadelphia and wow. had big big booming morning shows lots of money lots of accolades la 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 and that was tough from the standpoint of knowing what you want and just working every day, honing your craft like an athlete to make sure that your timing and your research and your focus and your uh, uh, education of music all came together. And then my second career was, you know, acting and television and film and so forth and directing a film, which is, but writing, uh, self-publishing specifically, the hardest thing is, let, let's, let's get real organic. You got a certain amount of money and you want to try to figure out i've got an, my book just came out the imposter plug and i said i've only got so much money that i can use to advertise is it going to be bookbub facebook instagram twitter etc so you decide the money do the ads hope it does well but you know you almost don't have the time to do the analysis to see if it hit the market just properly and if it like when I did my the first book in the sequel, the poser, I went with BookBub and I got a featured deal out of the gate 
and my sales were through the roof. For whatever reason, they didn't do it the second time. I suppose they didn't want the sequel and the sales were much different. So that's the most daunting, deciding how and where to spend the money. And uh, if it doesn't sell, uh, you, know, you, you don't have the feedback that you have. I mean, you're you're hitting uh, international bestseller list, Kindle bestselling list, and yes, self publishers do get a little bit of that. But you know, you have books fly off the shelves, and then which I'm getting to in a second, you co-write with some a very big name, and so not to say it's easier, but you do have doors that are open for you mm. that I don't have. Yeah. However, I completely intend to be a New York Times bestseller. So it's just, I know it's just a matter of time. I mean, that, I don't mean that to sound cocky. It's just that I've always kind of been hardwired that way that I, I don't quit until I get it. I, I, think, I think that's commendable. And I do think, you know, writing is part talent, part persistence. You know, if you, if you keep doing it, you get better. You keep, you know, you learn your craft, you hone your craft. It's like what you were saying about radio, and I'm sure you're experiencing with, with writing. You get better, um, and it becomes second nature to, it, it is like a muscle, you know, that creative part of your brain. You work it out, it will get better, it will get stronger. And so persistence is a huge, huge part of the, the writer's journey. The uh, tenacity is uh, kind of been one of the uh, anchors of my of my constitution is just I've got to figure it out. I didn't know how to write a book, so I learned how to write a book. Then I didn't know how to do a book into a screenplay, and I learned how to write screenplays, took the courses, and I didn't know how to turn that screenplay into a movie until I said, well, I got to go raise the money and then direct it because I've directed short. So I just kept hammering it until I got it. Now, are they blockbusters? No. But my joy comes in the process, a lot of it. You know, if you're not enjoying yourself, I mean, if you're doing it for money or, or you're doing it for the accolades and you're doing it for some great big award or something, I'm not so sure you'll be super pleased in the end. I don't know. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think I always say, well, I think it's, um, uh, I'm trying to remember which screenwriter it was who said it. Uh, it might have been Paul Schrader who said, if you can do anything other than write, do that. Yeah. You have to have passion for writing. I think you have to, because it is a, from the outside, it looks really easy. You're sitting there, you're typing away every, however, whatever your delivery period is, you'll every so often you'll put a book out and it'll hit the shelves. But actually for me, there's a lot of introspection involved. You're trying to, understand yourself you're trying to understand other people you're trying to understand characters you know if you want to bring people to life on the page you have to understand what brings them to life in the real world um and so you're getting inside people's heads you're getting inside your own head um for the kind of books that i write you're delving into some quite dark worlds you know i spent for black 13 i spent a long time looking at the far right and looking at um these kind of subversive groups um, and then, of course, when the book's published, you are taking those hits from critical readers and, you know, people who don't necessarily like it. And th there are people out there who don't like The Godfather, right? So <laughs> it doesn't matter what you make, someone's not going to like your work. Right. So it, it can be quite challenging. And I think that if you don't have that passion, if you don't have that burning desire for it, go and do something else. There are better ways to make money and there are better ways to get accolades than, than writing. You know, I think it was Steve. Absolutely. I think it was Stephen King who said, you know, if you're going to be a writer, you have to be a reader, some variation on that. And you've heard that a hundred different ways. When I first heard that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. But with time, I've learned it's so, so true. Meg Gardner's on the show next week, one of my favorite authors. And I went to school just reading Into the Black Nowhere, for instance. And I felt that same way with Black 13. This and, and again, this is not a suck up. I'm reading this and I literally caught myself going, wow, I think I think I can describe a situation better having read Adam's work. I mean, I, 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 I promise you, I thought that. Wow. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I, it is something that I uh, I think Graham Greene was brilliant at doing this and uh, Margaret Atwood as well. I think you know, part of the, there's so many different jobs you have as the writer, but I think part of it is to be the observer and to understand ways of looking at the world that are going to prompt 
uh, an emotional response in people or to stimulate their imagination. So we all know what a bus is like, right? We don't. We know. We we know. We know what a, what a, a sitting room, a living room, a bedroom. You know, we kind of have a rough idea of what all of these things are. So your job, I think, or my job as the writer is to try and explain why this description matters. What do I want the reader to take away from it, to feel, to experience, to to picture? And it doesn't require um, a lot of, you know, grand language or if you think about how you tell a story to a friend in the in the in a bar or in a restaurant, you don't go into you know well, we, we walked into the living room and it was it had a green drape hanging over the windows and there was a picture and in the picture there was a woman standing beside a a wall looking at a cinema screen. You don't do that. You just say we went into the living room and he grabbed the gun and like it all kicked off and you know. So <laughs> if you think about how you would tell a story naturally right. um, and what captivates people. You focus on the things that are important. You focus on the things that hold the interest. And so for me, my job as, a, as, a, as an author is to try and keep that interest as best I can and give enough color and enough spark to allow people to fill in. And, for, and again, it's the classic, you know, often cited example of Jaws. You know, you don't see the shark until really late in the movie, largely because it was broken for most of the shoot. Yeah. But... That was brilliant because it left it to the imagination. Sure. And the reader, the reader's imagination is the most powerful to, in, in the interaction between author and reader. The reader's brain is the most important part of that interaction. Yeah. And you just need to, you need to like fire off little, little sparks, you know, flares, just send those up into the, into the reader's brain and they'll do the rest. And I think that's what I meant when I said, um, quietly elegant and then the way you pulled me in because it really was just enough information to engage me and let me paint the you let me paint the picture of the room and the drapes or whatever and then i enter the room and meet the people and i and I, and you've given me just enough to lead my but not grab me by the hand and spoon feed me and i love that so yeah Big fan of Black 13. We know this. January, it came out. I know you've got a sequel. Uh, let's see. Red Wolves. Is it this month? Yeah, it comes out later this month. Yeah. So tell me where we go from Black 13 without spoilers, et cetera, that launches into Red Wolves, if you can. Yeah. So, um, you know, Scott Pierce has basically uncovered what looks like a um, fairly sort of substantial conspiracy. And it's uh, all of this is actually grounded in the real world. So it's all taken from research that I've done, going and talking to far right groups, looking at who's funding them, talking to the people who are involved in analyzing these groups from different agencies, shall we say, uh, um, in government and uh, the intelligence community and um, you know, talking to prisoners in prison who are in, in for, you know, racially aggravated murders who are part of these groups and i mean just a lot of research has gone into this um it's all kind of grounded in the real world and at the end of um, black 13 scott pierce you know kind of discovers that this conspiracy exists and the red walls book um, takes him and the team to seattle um on the west coast where they get involved in an opioid um there's a there's an opioid ring that they need to break uh and they discover that the people behind it are actually bringing in something far more sinister than uh, a uh, synthetic opiate. Um, so that's kind of the spoiler-free summary of uh, what happens in, in Red Wolves. Excellent. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm, I will be ripping through that one as well, I'm sure. Now, I'd love to talk about a gentleman who, uh, who is both respected and rejected by a lot of different people for a number of different reasons. He happens to be one of the very first guys that I started reading back when, probably 20 years ago. And I was completely enamored and amazed by his craftsmanship of terse, quick, page turning thrillers and short chapters and it was just perfect because i could i was flying a lot back and forth to east to west coast and i could burn through a book in one direction and that's james patterson probably one of the more prolific authors of our time i can't think of 
many more people outside of maybe two, two that have written more books than this gentleman. First of all, what was the, what was that like writing with him and how in the world did you get that gig? <laughs> uh, so Jim read uh, Pendulum, which was my first published book um, and really liked it and was kind enough to give me an amazing quote for the book. And uh, I, I wrote to him and said, thanks. And we just had the occasional exchange and I would let him know what I was doing. Um, and then uh, it actually came through his publisher and my, uh, they, they called my agent and said, look, would Adam be interested in writing something with Jim? And my agent called me up one day and said, how would you feel about doing this? And I just said, well, <laughs> you know, what, I, I, what a great, what a great honor, basically. It's a tremendous honor and um, it would be fantastic. And so, uh, you know, when I found out it was the private series, I'd read a few of them, but I hadn't read them all. I went through, you know, read all of them. And, um, you know, we talked about where we were going to take it and what to do with it. And uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic experience. And he is just so skillful as a writer. Um, and as you say, is is the master of getting you turning those pages and, and hooking you into a story and, and, and gripping you and holding you. So yeah, it's been a fantastic experience. And Private Moscow, the first book we worked on together, I think publishes in, in the US um, in April, 2022. For some reason, well, I know what the reason is. It's uh, it, there's the pandemic. I think we would have published a lot sooner. Sure, but because of the uncertainties of lockdowns and what's going to be open and what's not going to be open, um, the decision was taken to push it back a bit. I can't even fathom that. I mean, I I took his master class from the uh, masterclass.com and was amazed that he would sit there and basically tell you this is how I did it. This is how you should do it. Here's the trick of the trade. And, and it's, they, they all seem so, uh, so many of the points seem so obvious and so easy to understand that it almost seemed like, what uh, what well, that's it. <laughs> but the, the real art and the real craftsmanship is in not only following a bit of that recipe, but having the wherewithal like you and I have said already to be able to tell a story and you know, get to the point. That's one thing James is always Jim has always been good about is get to the point, have them do this, and you're on your way. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, when I started working with him, I was just doing the edits on Black Thirteen. You know, I, I, we talked a little bit about you know what the essence of good storytelling is, and I went back to Black Thirteen, and I just thought. Mm, there are a few things I need to change here. And so I think one of the tendencies as an author can be almost, you know, for, for a lot of books, authors do a tremendous amount of research. Yeah. And the tendency can almost be to show the reader how much research you've done. Yeah. So the reader feels, oh, my God, you know, this is a really smart author and they're obviously authentic and everything. And so I realized in the opening chapters of Black 13, I'd written – I told you know I'd learned a bit of Thai, and I, I had written a lot of the early exchanges when he's out in Thailand um, in Thai, and I just thought to myself, what on earth? It, like that just this is so dumb because you're not making it accessible for the reader. So I went back through the book and took out anything, and, and where there was any foreign you know languages used, I would always make sure there was a translation, you know, not overt but just subtle, so that the reader always knew what was going on, and it's just. Simple things like that. The short chapter was another one. My first three books, they're not exceedingly long, but they're much longer than I now write. And he just said, you know, basically the short chapter does a number of things, keeps the reader focused and it keeps you focused. And it means that, you know, the reader's going to be more likely to turn the page because you leave it, not necessarily a cliffhanger, but a question, what yeah. happens next? Yeah. And so if they look flick forward, which we all do, we all flick forward through the book and say, oh, there's only three pages, five pages in the next chapter. I'm just going to read it, right? But if you flick forward and you see, oh, there's 20 pages, mm, you know what? It's too late. I'm going to put this down. Yeah. So just something as simple as the short chapter. Yeah, that is the one 
that's the one takeaway that I that I took away uh, years ago and I've tried to do ever since. But you're right. And the quote was of Pendulum, one of the best thrillers of the year. So when you got a guy like that saying that about your book and you get to plaster that on the, the lead of all of your books, that has got to feel awesome. I mean, think about this. Going back to your question about the hardest thing for a self-publisher. If all of a sudden I come to you and I go, Adam, did you like my book? And if you would you read it? And if you like it, would you give me a line? I mean, I, I often I often think about this and we've I've talked to other self-publishers about this and about the um, the quandary of is it rude to ask it? When should you ask? Is the book do you feel like the book is good enough? Is it the very best? So then you can approach someone to then ask them for that blurb and uh I don't know that I have a great answer for that, but I sure would like to hear what you have to think. My answer is just ask, <laughs> you know, like it never hurts to ask. If, if somebody is busy, they'll say, if somebody doesn't like it, they'll come up with a polite way of, you know, saying that, uh, uh with, 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 um, with Jim, I had nothing to do with it. I, in fact, in my idiocy, had no idea how important quotes are for books. No idea. I did no networking. I didn't meet anyone. My editor sent the book out to Jim and she's been sending every single book she's published to him for a number of years. And this was the first one he ever responded to. Wow. Yeah. And it just came in one day and everyone was super excited. And I was kind of like, and I didn't understand publishing. I hadn't taken the time to get educated in the way that I now am. And at the time I was just, oh, this is great. You know, James Patterson, huge author. This is fantastic. I'm really glad he likes my book. Never occurred to me they were going to stick it on the cover and it was a really big deal and it would help with retailers. And, and so, yeah, in a way I was very naive. If I could go back <laughs> armed with the knowledge I now have, I would, you know, have um, made more of the opportunity that that presented, but also created other opportunities for myself. And I would say to anyone who's a debut author, um, or, or not a debut author, anyone who's an author full stop, that so much of, um, of being an author nowadays is the connections, the friendships you make, the relationships you build, um, because th it's a business that requires support. It requires other authors championing your book and saying, you know, this is really good, please read it. Uh, so I would say to anyone, uh, self-published or not, you know, throw yourself into it with as much gusto as you can, become part of the community and most people are really friendly and helpful and will try and, you know, support other authors wherever they can. That is great advice. <clears throat> and I would agree. I was able to go to uh, Thriller Fest back in the 19, right before the pandemic. And it and I've, I've often said this on my show, it's one of the best adventures I've ever had in my entire life. And I was mesmerized. I was not only surprised, I was mesmerized by the fact that you had access to so many really terrific people, well-known authors who were as approachable and pleasant and kind and generous as I, more than I could ever imagine. That had a profound effect on me. And, and one thing I took away from it, and I, and I got this sense from a lot of different people, is that, and, and, and it's completely counterintuitive to the way I've brought, been brought up in radio and television and film, is it's not competitive. Like you, you would no more, I don't think, would any more be competitive with me because you have a particular style, a particular uh, character with a particular uh, viewpoint and a different background. And, um, and I, I just love that. I, I think that's remarkable because like I said, it's so unusual. It, it is, it's very unusual. And I was at Thriller Fest in 2019. Um, so we probably passed each other in the Hyatt. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you're absolutely right. I remember the first time I went to Thriller Fest would have been 2017. And um, yeah, I was just floored that you could, you know, walk down the corridor. There's Lee Child here, stop and have a chat, you know, talk, talk to you. And, um, you know, you, you meet, you know, Heather Graham, Steve Berry, and all these people who are phenomenal sellers and phenomenal writers. And uh, they would support you however they could and help you, give you advice, you know, offer to blurb your book and just, yeah, absolutely. And, and it is something you don't see in other industries. And I think you're absolutely right. It's because there is no direct competition. Hmm. Um, and, you know, it's exciting to discover a new voice. And I think that what you were saying earlier about 
you know, writers have to be readers. Yeah. You get excited as a reader when you find somebody that's good and new and, you know, whatever that, whatever their genre or whether it's literary fiction or whatever it is, you get excited that you found something that's really good and you want to share it with people. And I think that doesn't die no matter how successful you become as a writer. Whereas if you're an actor, if you're a director, you're always pitching for the same gig as your, your actor type. You know, if you're a director, you're always pitching for that job. It's really competitive. It's brutal. Yeah. I've got a, a friend who's, a, I've got a friend who's an actor, uh, you know, who made the mistake of chatting to another actor before audition. And the other actor said, you know, what's your interpretation of the script? And what do you think about the character and everything? The other actor went in first and through the door, my friend heard the other actor use his entire spiel, all the prep work that he'd done was used in order to get the role. And of course you can't go in then and say the same thing. No. So on the spot, so it, it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal in other fields as I'm sure you know. Oh yeah, there were many a time that I would go in uh, to an audition and I would um, walk in and check in and look down the row and there are 14 guys that look just like me or pretty close to it. And then you get into the room and there's 20 people that you have to perform for and you've heard some of what they've done and you've got your interpretation of what you've done. You want to be kind, but you, it's so competitive. It's, oh, it's brutal. Oh, I, I don't, I mean, I, I talked to my, you know, we talked about getting bad reviews and whatever as a writer, but I just don't understand how actors do it. Because literally I've heard of, you know, actor, you know, actor friends who walked into the audition and they've just said, literally just walk in, no, sorry. Yeah. Just taking a look and out, you're done. <laughs> I, uh, I read for, I read for to Tony Scott and I walked in, semi haunts me because I did my thing. And when I was done, he was like, right. Um, well, thank you. And, and went back to his notes and they issued me out. And I was, oh, oh it's brutal. You could have given me something. Oh, and that's, I know. Uh, of course, I could have sucked, Adam. It was very likely that I sucked pretty bad, but. but even so, I, but I think, I think just the sheer volume of people that they're seeing, eventually they become numb to it and they it can't did. be bothered to get notes. You know, they just. Yes, and, and having directed a film, I know what it's like to be on the other end. So I have to bring in people and, and I, you can almost tell within 30 seconds. I mean, let's, you know, you have the look, the feel, the energy, and then the delivery, the confidence, and then the whole time you're analyzing it, but you pretty much, you, you pretty much got an idea before they leave the room, but I've always tried to, that was fantastic. Thank you. Because I know what it's like to be on that side and you know, yeah. great job. And we'll be in touch because we're all, we're just humans, man. We're just trying to get through this thing and practice our craft. That's exactly it. And that, that's, you know, that, that's one thing that I think, um, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Angry or Miss Angry, when they're on uh, Amazon, you know, giving their one star review, maybe think there's a human. I personally don't read them, but that others do. There's a human at the other end who's just trying to make it in the world. And there's no reason to get so heated about, I don't know what it is, like, the, you know, the, the the Ford don't make yellow cars or whatever it is that's got your, <laughs> your backup. Right. Well, a quick side note, uh, when I released my, uh, the poser the first go around, I don't know what I was thinking, Adam. I'm like, oh, I can I can edit this myself. It'll be OK. That was such a painful, painful lesson to learn, because uh, after about the sixth or seventh, what was this guy? Did he was he editing this thing in the dark, you know, et cetera? Et cetera. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I realized I will never release another thing until it's gone through, you know, four, five, six, seven different passes. And that was a painful lesson to learn. But I, I, I made that lesson with the, I made that mistake with the book I self published. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, people were more forgiving. They sort of said, well, he hasn't noticed that he's changed the kid's name. So yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> And I know you kind of have that shrinking feeling inside when you read it and you realize, oh no, because it's, that's your shop face. You know, yeah. that's your shop face. That's your opportunity to interact and engage with people and you kind of fluffed it. So yeah. <laughs> You're gonna make the first impression once, right? Yeah. 
Uh, here's a question that's been rattling around in my head since I've been uh, digging digging deep on Adam. Is uh, So Pendulum, book one of the series, released May 2018. Free Fall, number two, comes out July. And then Aftershock comes in November. So, okay, one month between first two books and three months until the third. How did you pull that off? Uh, that was nothing to do with me. That was my publishers. I think Pendulum... Uh... In, in the States, I think it came out in hardback in 2017, actually. So it may have only been paperback that came out. Okay. Um, uh, so I think the hardbacks had a year be between them. And then I, I don't understand what the publication schedule was with the paperbacks. Um, you, you'll be surprised. I know authors who I, I at least got told and was involved in the marketing and did some promotion and stuff. But I know authors who've had books come out in America and not known that the books have come out. So the books just come out. Yeah. And they find out when their agent sends them a royalty statement or something. Oh, my book came out. What? What? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you kind of, it just, it depends on how engaged you are, how much the publisher wants you involved, how, you know, much of a say you have on yeah. publication schedules a lot of the time you, you really have no say on publication schedules because it's structured around when they think this book's going to sell what time you know the optimal time of year is and you know that's that's kind of the publisher's expertise and sometimes right. they'll call it right and sometimes they won't well uh fortunately or unfortunately i'm a bit of a control freak and you have to be when you're you know driving the boat and fixing the meal downstairs and you know everything at once but um, I do realize that you do forfeit some of your control um, while gaining a lot more work. I think that's a big misnomer. And I, I think I learned that early on is, you know, and I referenced this earlier by, oh, I landed my deal. I got a big fat check. I can sit back and just wait for it to happen. And you can tell me probably quite frankly that that just does no way in hell happens. No, uh, you know, most of the authors that I know who are, well, it doesn't matter what level of success they're all working all the you know the time to try and build their readership they're trying to um hone their craft they're you know a large part of today's you know author time is spent on social media um communicating doing public appearances doing digital appearances do you know there's a lot of promotion involved to try and get the you, you know, your work out to as many readers as possible. Um, so I don't, I don't really know anyone who just kind of sits back regardless of how they're published or what they're doing. You know, I would say self-published authors I know probably work much harder, but it's maybe 20%, 30% harder than the published authors I know. I'm in a different boat because I write a lot. So, um, you know, next year I've got uh, three books coming out. Wow. Um, yeah, Private uh, Beijing, um, White Fire, which is the third Scott Pierce book. And then The Other Side of Night, which is a real departure for me, which is um, it's kind of a speculative fiction uh, novel in the vein of, I'd say, sort of David Mitchell, Matt Haig, the crime element to it. It's, it's quite different. It's a real uh, departure for me. So that's coming out in the US and the UK in September 2022. So next year is going to be a busy year for me. Um, uh, and obviously Private Moscow publishes in the States in April 2022. So I'm going to be around. <laughs> I hope people don't get sick of seeing my name. Not going to happen, Adam. Not if I, I hope not. Do with I it. hope not. <laughs> so you got Private Moscow, um, Other Side of Night, and what was the middle one? White? White Fire, which is the third um, Scott Pierce book. And then here in the UK, we've got Private Beijing, which is the third book that I'm doing with James Patterson. Um, so, and I think that will be released in the States probably a, a couple of years after it's released in the UK. Now, does Jim, does Jim say, hey, Adam, you're a nifty chap. Uh, let's just do a half a dozen of these. Uh, not so far. We've just kind of talked book to book. Yeah. Um, and... You know that's that's absolutely fine by me um, because you know it's a it's an ongoing series. There have been other co-writers that have worked on the books before. Um, you know the first 
to private Moscow was, had a really good reception. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've enjoyed writing them all and we'll see how long that, that goes on for. I wouldn't want to do it for longer than we're both really happy to, to do it because yeah. I'm a fan of Jim's work and, you know, I want him to have the best possible uh, book come out, you know, for, to keep his readers happy. So we've both got to feel comfortable and happy that uh, we're going to produce something really good. Sure. I realize that I have been asking oodles of questions and I've still got a few to go and I'm looking at the clock and we're uh, coming up on time. So I want to cut through a couple of things. I want to get to screenwriting in a second, one of my favorite things, but let me back up. So your life prior to writing, and I, 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 want, I want to know what this is, strategy consultant who advised global businesses in medicine, robotics, technology, and financial services. So my question is, Tell my audience what that career was like, because uh, it sounds massively impressive. How is uh, it? Sure. Oh, massively impressive. Um, I originally trained as a lawyer. I wanted to go into um, law. I had a place at bar school to become a barrister because we have these quaint traditions over here in England. Uh, and only people in horsehair wigs can appear in front of a judge in court. It certainly used to be the case. But I decided uh, law wasn't for me after spending my final term of university uh, doing commercial law. It was quite dry. So I went and uh, joined Lloyd's of London after a period set, spent sort of searching around what I was going to do. And I don't quite know how, but I ended up working with the um, special advisor to the board and got a lot of board level exposure and ended up working with McKinsey's. And um, then got headhunted by a uh, strategy consultancy um, and ended up working with them. And basically what the job involves doing is going into companies, big companies, and telling them how to do things better. Um, a lot of consultants will go in to do downsizing and cost cutting, and that wasn't what we did. We went in and talked about growth and how to grow your markets, grow your businesses. You know, So in the medical sector, I was looking at uh, specialist equipment, MRI scanners, CT scanners, and how this particular company, which is a huge global brand, could sell um, more of these you know, $10 million machines to hospitals. Uh, so you'd go in and do market analysis, you'd talk to customers and all that sort of thing, and then you'd present. And quite often, you know, quite often it would be the employees within those organizations, they would have the answers, but various sort of structural or organizational things, elements would prevent the higher ups, the executives from listening to them. So you'd go in and you talk to the employees who are on the call face and who know what the customers are saying every single day. And you wouldn't just parrot what they were saying because there's analysis and other things involved. But a lot of the time, they would have the answers lying within their organization. They just really didn't know where to look. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I made money for big companies. I, I worked with big companies and, and you know, helped them understand how they could make more money. It was well paid and it wasn't very rewarding. And that's why I left. <laughs> Well, and so I, I want to know how that influenced your new career. Did you, was it a matter of, uh, that's not for me and I want to do something else? Or you, you had to have already had the bug to write. So you were probably thinking, am I, would it be safe to say you're thinking, well, if I'm not particularly fulfilled there and I'm financially okay, then I want to go take a chance at what I really want to do. Anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I've always written throughout my life, uh, you know, from a kid, always writing things down, writing stories, writing plays, right? You know, always, even when I was working, um, always be writing. And um, it was actually my, my father passed away quite suddenly. And I just thought, you know, life, it was literally life is too short. I want to go and do something I love. Um, and I love writing. And that's, that's what put me on the road. So everyone thought I was crazy, you know, leaving a well-paid, successful career. Um, but I just felt it was something I had to do. Yeah, I've got uh, friends who say a similar thing, like, why don't you go back into radio? If you had such a prolific career in radio, why not go back to it? And I say, well, first of all, it was a goal early on and kind of been there, did that. Second of all, the radio landscape changed forever with consolidation because all the yeah. corporations would buy up everyone. So you, it wasn't what it used to be. And I'm like, we've only got so much time on this earth. So why not go try to accomplish something new? And if you fail, so you, f so you fail, you know, you get up and try something else. I think that, that that's 
why what you were saying about having you have to enjoy the process it's the process not the destination you know it's the journey not the destination you have to enjoy the process and and that's why you should become a writer because you enjoy the process of sitting down and putting together a story and creating characters and thinking about all those things um and and yeah life life for me is too short and i hear a lot of friends who are in the city or who are lawyers and they say well i'm going to do this when i retire or i'm going to i'm going to just do another five years and then i'm going to quit and do what i really love you know you, you, you they never do they stay yeah. and they stay and they say and there's always another carrot to just entice you to you know move along and um everyone has to make their own choices but for me i was going to do what i love no matter what the cost was and um it took a number of years and and it was quite hard uh, making that break but um yeah, so far touchwood it seems to be working out okay excellent i do want to jump to screenwriting and um i know that you've dabbled in that uh, quite a bit and have you always wanted to try this is and do you see this as something you'll do more of perhaps even overseeing the translation of some of your books into screenplays etc so i actually I started screenwriting before I started writing novels. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so it was, I, I felt more comfortable with that um, yeah, for various reasons. It's just a form that's much easily, more easily accessible. And also growing up, I'd always sort of hero worshipped authors. And, you know, the idea of being responsible for creating mood and character and story and plot and atmosphere, and it, it, it's, it's a lot. And as you'll know from directing a, a movie, uh, the screenplay is, an arc, is, a, is, a, is a sort of blueprint. It's a diagram that others use to bring the movie to life. And that somehow felt less daunting for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I started off screenwriting. And then, as I'm sure you'll also be aware, you can make a lot of progress in screenwriting. And I had things optioned and I got hired to do adaptations and, you know, various sort of really good milestones, but ultimately you have no control. So a project can, you know, fall apart because an executive leaves the studio, uh, you know, because a producer suddenly loses interest in it, an actor that was attached to it, you know, goes off and does something else. There are all sorts of things that can make a, a, a movie not happen. And I got close quite a few times. Nice. Um, with some high profile uh, talent. And, 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 and at that point, I just thought I really want to do something that I have control over. And I'm scared of novel writing. And I don't like being afraid of things, I'm going to write a book. And that was it. That's how I got into uh, writing, you know, writing longer form pieces. I love it. This from the guy who will climb a rock and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As we uh, start to wrap up, I know that you're one of the hosts and founders of CapitalCrime.org. Uh, share with uh, my audience what this group is about. It, it has a feeling similar to, and I hope this is complimentary to ITW, International Thriller Writers. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm also on the board of ITW. So it actually was inspired by Thriller Fest and you know, uh, make no bones about that. Uh, David Headley, who is uh, runs... Um, the literary agency I'm represented by, uh, and he also owns one of London's um, biggest and best bookshops. Um, we, were, we were at Thriller Fest together, I think it was 2018, and we just loved it. We just said, why isn't there one of these in London? You know, why isn't there something like this um, for crime and thriller fans? And that's, that's where it was born. And uh, Kimberly Howe, who's um, now, executive director of ITW um, is on the capital crime um, advisory board. So we, we have a very good relationship. Awesome. And basically the idea is to create a home for crime and thriller fans um, with the physical festival, which is you know similar to what uh, Thriller Fest does with panels and events. Um, but also we've launched, you know, in this kind of odd 18 months, this difficult period with the pandemic, we've launched a, a book club, monthly subscription book club, so people can subscribe and get um, two books uh, sent to them every month. And that's open internationally. There's no additional charge. So anyone who's listening can sign up for that. And we then give our subscribers 
um, exclusive content, interviews with authors and that sort of thing. So we also do a social outreach program to get um, underrepresented uh, people into writing and publishing. Um, and we've launched a New Voices Award in collaboration with Amazon Publishing. So there's currently, um, I think the entries close on the 3rd of August. We've, we've got a competition running and the first prize is a publication deal with Thomas and Mercer. Wow. So, yeah, so we've done a lot to try and, you know, help bolster the crime and thriller community. So you don't have to live in London to be a part of this. I, I could I could be a part no. of this. You can, yeah, if you wanted to join our subscription service, if you wanted to enter the, the competition, uh, yeah, anyone, anywhere in the world. So we're, we're completely international. It's funny, London is on my, I cannot believe I've never been to London. It's, it's one of the things I've always wanted to do. And so you can be sure that in these upcoming non-ban travel days, I'm going to get a piece of London. Oh, brilliant. I look forward to it. Well, let me know when you're in town. Uh, absolutely. And and I just was checking the website and KJ and I uh, keep in touch occasionally. And it uh, looks like they're going to bring Thriller Fest back to New York next year. New hotel, maybe even. And uh, I'm very excited about that. I, I, I encourage anyone, self-pub, otherwise, uh, drop the dime and go. It's one of the best things you will ever do in your life, I think. Uh, completely, I completely agree. I completely agree. The the inspiration, the advice, the insight, the access, just it's unparalleled, unparalleled. We so were you there when um, George R. R. Martin was there when he was the guest, or was was that the year before? I'm getting confused now. I want to say that was eighteen. Yeah. So it was um, uh, Sanford, wasn't it? When yes, 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 yeah. Oh, I when got Sanford. to hang out with John Sanford. I was a I'm a big Prey series uh, guy. Yeah. And. Yeah. What I really took away from him was I, <laughs> I love his kind of a curmudgeon-y little take on everything. It's like, what's your secret, John? I sit down and write. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but can you imagine? Can you imagine how many times these big bestsellers are asked that, you know, every single time they appear in public? You know, what's your secret? Well, it, it, I sit down and write, but it's them, you know, that it's me sitting down and writing. It's John Sanford sitting down or Lee Child sitting down and writing. And it's a very different experience, I'd imagine, from you and me sitting down and writing. All right. Well, then I'm going to scratch this next question right here. <laughs> Most of us writers, knowing other processes, can you share yours with my audience as it pertains to the writing schedule and perhaps some of the ways you could find your... Well, I tell you what, actually, I do have... I've just finished teaching a course on uh, um, crime writing uh, for the Arvon Foundation, um, which is a big creative arts foundation over here in the UK. And uh, yeah, I mean, I am a planner and I believe in building out. So I'll do a one page summary, a five page summary, and then a 20 page chapter breakdown, chapter by chapter of the whole book. Um, you know, it'll be somewhere between 15 and 20 pages and it's the key beats of what happens. I won't stick to it religiously. You know, you kind of riff as you're going along as you're writing the book. Um, but I find it really useful to have the architecture of the story and you can move it around and you can play around with it. And just from an editorial point of view, it's a lot easier to manipulate first a page, then five pages, then 15 to 20 pages than it is to manipulate 100 to 120,000 words, however long your um, first draft is. So oh. if you can do as much work up front, I think it helps. Um, and then the other thing I do is I write by hand. I write everything by hand with a fountain pen. And no, I'm not from the 16th century. Um, but I do, I find that is really um, useful because, uh, there's something about the connection to the written word that I find makes the ideas flow more easily and allows you to be more creative. And then when you're typing it up, so I transcribe that, you have your first edit before you have a proper edit. So as you're going, you're thinking, oh, I don't actually like the way that's phrased. I'm going to change it a bit. And, you know, you actually then um, get a chance to edit it as you as you type it up. So that's my process. I love that. I know that uh, Jim is also, he long hands of, and pencil on legal pads, doesn't he? Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of us, Anthony Horowitz, Steve Kavanaugh, you know, there's a bunch of us uh, who are 
I think Adrian McKinty as well. I think there's a, there's a few of us who are handwriters and we compare notes on fountain pens every now and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love a good fountain pen. I don't have the um, patience to watch my writing. I mean, I'll, I tend to do this thing as my hand gets tired. It's like, meh. And then I come back later and I go, what the hell did I write? What the <laughs> I am the only one who can read my, uh, my manuscript, which is good. <laughs> Do you uh, do you listen? Do you have a particular kind of music that you listen to while you're writing? Or are you one of these guys that likes to write in silence? I don't like silence. I like music, uh, so I will listen. To, I will pick a piece for the piece of work. Yeah, and I will listen to it constantly. Yeah, yeah. For the whole time I'm writing that um, book or screenplay, whatever it is. Uh, because it helps get me in the mood, it helps set the tone, it helps all of that sort of thing. So um, it depends on what the piece of work is. It might be something like the Oblivion soundtrack by M83. Uh, a lot of the time when I'm writing my own uh, or the private series with Jim, I'll be doing, um, uh, I'm a big fan of drum and bass. So people like Netsky, Camo and Crooked, Etherwood, um, mm -hmm. 180 beats per minute, perfect for an action sequence, like just you know, gets the blood pumping and you're, you're away. So yeah. So that's what I listen to a lot when I'm writing. Yeah. When I'm writing, uh, when I'm writing like a developing, a, a, an intense scene, I love anything to do with like the born, uh, series that composer, um, when I'm writing an action scene, I'll often go to like Tiesto, which is you, you were referencing 180. I look for like 165 to 180 beats per minute. And yeah. oh, I can freaking sail uh, when I get that, you know. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's funny. It really can. Uh, you know, I think and that's why music is so magical. It's very visceral. It really changes your mood. It can elevate. It can, you know, depress. It can, you know, you know invigorate. I think it's absolutely, you know, the musicians I know are, I'm really envious of because they can change the energy in a room or a concert hall just in moments. Oh, yeah. Having done radio, this is part of the things <clears throat> that I'd often we would ask guests on the show. And I, I doubt that you'd ever be deserted on an island because you'd figure out a way to rock climb off of it or talk to the natives with your lawyer background to get out of a particular situation. Let's but let's pretend you're uh, grounded on a, an, a, an exotic island somewhere for whatever length of time. And you have you get to be with one person. You got one book. And you got one CD, assuming that you had a magical CD player snuck up in the tree somewhere. What would those three elements be? And one person, does that include or exclude spouse, like wife or? I'll make it easy on you. So you can bring your spouse, but it's one, one person living or dead that you'd love to have hanging around while you're uh, stuck on this island. Okay. All right. Well, I'll start with the CD first, because that's really easy for me. I would um, take uh, Pink Floyd's album, Wish You Were Here. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, I, I I just love that. It's so inspirational and imaginative and kind of just takes you to different worlds, really. So it's, it's an amazing record. I can listen to it anytime, all the time. A book, I would probably go for um, The Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, I, Alexander Dumas. Yeah, because if you're stuck somewhere and you want to get off, um, you probably want to read about taking revenge on the people that had stuck you on that island. Uh, no, I, I think it's one of the best adventure novels. Um, it has its flaws because I think they would probably recognize Edmond Dantes. Um, but other than that, it's just an incredible tale of suffering and vengeance um uh, with lots of action and intrigue and adventure uh, and for me it's kind of the archetypal original thriller oh. um, and then person in addition to my wife who is also my soulmate and we've been sweethearts since we were 18. i love that uh, i would um i probably also take a, a gentleman called rudy verber who was the he was the third person to escape from auschwitz and um, a while back, I optioned the rights to his book, which is called I Escaped from Auschwitz, and tried to bring it to screen. Um, and it's an absolutely incredible story. And I'd love to talk to him more about his experiences, because 
it's it's an amazing book and anyone who hasn't read it i would highly recommend it it can be quite hard to get uh, to come by but it's it's written like a thriller it's wow. written about this young 18 year old man who tries to go to britain to fight the nazis and he ends up trying to cross europe and ends up in auschwitz and he survives there for two years and it's his story of how he survives there um and it's quite incredible and i won't put in any you know, sort of spoilers because it's an emotive story. It's a thrilling story. And it's a story of, of retaining your humanity in the face of great horror. I think he'd be an absolutely fascinating person to talk to, not just because of that experience, but because afterwards he went on to become an incredible um, uh, neurochemist specializing in brain chemistry. Yeah. Um, he wanted to understand how the human mind could do the things that the Nazis had done. Uh, and so I think he'd be a great scientist to talk to as well as a, you know, his, as a result of his, his, uh, his experiences. Wow. Fascinating. I'm going to look, look that up. Rudy Verber. Yeah. So R U D I V R B A. And his book was, um, I escaped from Auschwitz. And honestly, it reads like a thriller. It's just, but there's so much more to it, obviously. It's an absolutely fascinating book. Well, I think the best way to wrap this up, especially for my Thriller Zone viewers and listeners, especially if they're writers or thinking about writing, is coming from one of the best writers out there, in my opinion, and I mean that in all sincerity, what is perhaps the single best piece of advice you would give someone who is thinking about giving writing a spin? What would you say? I'd say get started, <laughs> get started, you know, get started and just write and write small. If you have to, if you don't have a lot of time in your day, write, you know, write a short story, write, uh, write a poem. I went and did a poetry course two years ago um, because it's a form that I've never really engaged with or experienced very much of um, beyond what you learn in school and I've read a bit of poetry, but not a lot. And it taught me so much about the economy of language. You're talking about description. So if you don't have a lot of time, whatever it is, just start writing, start writing, start honing your craft, read a lot, think about, um, you know, who you want to be as a writer and get to work because it will take a long time to find your voice and to develop your skills as a writer. Um, so you may as well begin that journey today. That is superb. And you, you touched on a really key point and it's something I used to i didn't quite understand but i'm beginning to understand it more all the time and that is voice because your voice just like your regular speaking voice is so unique to you and it does take a while to find that because you want to mimic someone you really like or you think this is cool or in right now but when you when you lock in hone into that thing that is really specifically you I think that's where the gold happens. Yeah, I completely agree. And it does take a while for that to happen. And I think if you talk to authors who, I mean, uh, Red Wolves is my seventh novel. Um, I'm now starting work on my 10th. Uh, I think if you talk to people who've written a number of books, they'll all tell you the same thing. You know, you don't, you're always learning. So mm -hmm. you'll learn throughout. It's one of those. And that's what makes it so wonderful because there's always something new. You know, you're always learning. Um, but you don't find your voice for a while. Right. Um, and actually, once you find your voice, <laughs> the next trick is to lose your voice. It's to actually start losing your voice to the world and the characters and the tone of the book that you're trying to write. So um, you'll, you'll see it in you know, really successful authors who are maybe have done 15, 20 books, you'll pick up, you know, say their eighth book and their ninth, the 19th book. And they'll be, they'll be like, they've been written by completely different authors. Oh, wow. And you find, and you find that their style fits with the nature of the book. So, you know, it, it will have a very different feel, a very different voice to it, depending on the, the tone and the theme and the genre of the novel that they're that they're working on. So I, I think that that's that's kind of the next step in the journey for me is I kind of know more or less what my voice is. And now I'm going to try and lose it and try and like adhere to the truth of the work. If that doesn't sound too pretentious, you know, it's like, you know, 
put the voice around it that it needs to have. Yeah. I'm getting too mad. I've listened to too much Pink Floyd. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I will chew on that as I'm having lunch because that is really interesting because it it feels um, contradictory. And then I and then all of a sudden it clicked in my head and I get it. So you work to get you find your voice. And then if your voice is so prominent that it distracts from the story, you almost have to lose it to be truthful to the story. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's it's also, it's like, I think when you found your voice as an author, you kind of know, what, it, to me, it's almost like you know what you're doing. You, 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 and that sounds weird that you could be four or five books in and still not really know what you're doing. I think when you found your voice, you know what you're doing. And then the next challenge is to push yourself outside of that. It's to, it's to explore you know, different narrative voices as you're putting together a story. Look, you know, I'll come back in a little while and you can ask me, you know, maybe if you'll have me back again, I'll uh, I'll come back and uh, let you know how it went, <laughs> whether it was a good idea. Well, I'll tell you what I'd love to do. Uh, I am going to pick up uh, a copy of Red Wolves when it comes out. And uh, what I'd love to do is, and it, it could be till next year, but I'd love to sit down with you and do this podcast again when I can start doing them face to face, which is infinitely more interesting. It, I mean, yeah. it's interesting, don't get me wrong, but infinitely interesting when you can really, you're not looking at glass and a computer, you're actually sitting there. Yeah. I think that would be great. I mean, I'm, I'm planning, you know, all things being equal, hopefully, uh, in the world. Um, I'm planning to be at Thriller Fest next year. So it'll be the first weekend of June next year. So maybe we could sit down there. Absolutely. I'm going to uh, get a suite or whatever and set up, uh, be able to do the show uh, continuously throughout the event. Uh, I do want to say a big shout out to our, and thanks to our mutual friend, Eric, the body man Bishop for introducing us. So thank you for that. Yeah. Great guy, big heart. Fantastic guy. Eric Bishop, uh, body man's coming out in November. So yes. make sure you pick that up. It's uh, a cracking uh, read and you really do need to know who the body man is and what he's up to. So, yes. uh, yeah, and he's a fantastic guy. He is. Uh, you can find more about Adam at adamhamby.com and Twitter at the same, which I noticed that you're only on Twitter. Is that is that to keep your self-focused? And so the Instagrams and the Facebooks are a little bit too much or too distracting or what? I would prefer not to be on social media at all. I'll be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, I I like writing. I didn't get into this to become a brand or to you know be on social media. I like writing. I like writing books. Um, but I know it's important, and readers like to connect with you, and uh, publishers like you to be out there and talking about your work and stuff. So um, I keep one channel, you know, that I'm active on uh, Facebook. I have a profile, but I don't. Someone else manages that. So. But yeah, I mean, I, I admire authors who are all over, who have full coverage, but it just takes up so much time. I'm not sure how they do it. Well, I will say to that point, um, you know, I, I've i gone from two podcasts. I'm really kind of focusing only on one because by the time you we have the interview and then I edit it or polish it and so forth and then promote it and then post it, you know, and do audio books for clients and keep my voiceover business going. And I want to write. I, I find myself, if I don't, you have to be, again, back to discipline. You got to be so focused and so disciplined that if you spend all your time on social media, not only do I find it to be a little distracting, but you're not really being true to the mission while we're here, which is crafting stories. Yeah, the writing. And that's that's what I really enjoy. That's what I um, get into. Uh, you know, I have a mailing list and I send my emails every now and again to people just updating them on what I'm doing. And I use my real email. If people want to contact me, they can just email me, you know? So it's, uh, I I try and strike a balance. I'm accessible enough, I think, um, without it interfering with the work. Well, I am so, so grateful for your time. You gave me a a whole lot of time, Adam, and I'm, I'm sincere. I really am very appreciative of it. I'm, I'm glad you know, to, uh, to have been part of this. It's really interesting talking to you, David, and uh, thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I really do hope we can get to hang out next year at Thriller Fest. Oh, count on it. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. And thanks to everyone for listening as well. Yes. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, really nice to get to know you, David, and uh, we'll be in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. 
How cool was it spending time with Adam Hamdi? Man, what a nice chap. And folks, I got to tell you something. Next week, that's Friday, the July 23rd. A very, very special guest. Oh, <laughs> I am so stoked. Meg Gardner. That's right, the Meg Gardner. The gal that wrote books like, oh, I don't know, some of your favorites, some of mine. Unsub, Into the Black Nowhere, The Dark Corners of the Night, Creepy Characters, Page Turning Thriller. Yes, you'll also remember her from, let's see, Ransom River, The Shadow Tracer, Phantom Instinct. That's the standalone books. But how about the Joe Beckett series? The Dirty Secrets Club, The Memory Collector, The Liar's Lullaby, The Nightmare Thief. Oh, wait, there's the Evan Delaney series, China Lake, Mission Canyon, Jericho Point, Crosscut, Kill Chain. <laughs> yeah, uh, hashtag prolific. Also, one of the most beautiful, charming, intelligent, funny, witty gals you'll ever meet, Meg Gardner. That is next Friday the 23rd. Please be sure to join us. Until next time, this is David Temple for The Thriller Zone. <laughs>